delighted to have a wonderful speaker tonight. And this event, um, despite there being empty chairs now, the event was sold out more quickly than any other event that I can remember or that I think um, Nicholas can remember either. Within the first week, it was totally sold out. I guess a lot of people maybe were deterred by the rain or something came up at the last minute, but there's a lot of interest in this speaker and this topic. So tonight's event is sponsored by um, the UCSF Department of Psychiatry, the UCSF School of Nursing, the UCSF Depression Center, and the National Network of Depression Centers, which I'll explain just a, a little bit. But uh, first of all, tonight's speaker, um, the topic is the genetics of personality and depression, how mental health researchers try to use genetics to understand who we are. And tonight's speaker is Jonathan Flint. He received his medical degree and his postgraduate training at Oxford University in England. He's an expert in the genetic and cellular, cellular molecular mechanisms of depression and how genetics interact with the environment to yield who we are. Um, he completed already a, an amazing study that's gotten a lot of press and has helped a lot of researchers, sequencing DNA in more than 5,000 Chinese depressed individuals and 5,000 healthy individuals. And he found, um, it was the first study to find a link to specific genes in depression. He's also the co-director of a marvelous um, program at UCLA called the UCLA Depression Grand Challenge. And that aims to have the economic and health impacts of depression by 2050, to cut the economic and um, health impact in half by 2050. He also is about to lead a 100,000 person investigation, um, the Grand Challenge, which will be the largest ever genetic study of a single disorder. So that's Dr. Flint, and just a bit about the NNDC. The National Network of Depression Centers has been in business for about five or so years, something like ten. Ten years. Ten years of time flies when you're having a good time. <laughs> and their goal is to foster connections and collaborations between the individual sites um, to foster, through the power of a network, greater research, education, and, um, and treatment of depression. Um, right now, there are 23 centers of excellence within the NNDC, and um, UCSF is proud to be one of them, among other top universities such as Harvard, University of Pennsylvania, Stanford, UC San Diego, etc. So, with that as a background, um, I'm very glad, we're very honored to introduce Dr. Jonathan Flint. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. So, I started uh, my presentation by showing you this slide just to indicate that the subject is still of great interest uh, to the media and therefore one presumes to, um, to the general public. The effects uh, that make us what we are personality, our mood. And um, my task this evening is to uh, try and inculcate in you some criticism towards some of these findings and make you a little skeptical about some of the stuff that uh, this journal and others might publish. And to do so, I'm going to have to teach you a little bit of psychology, um, even less genetics, but unfortunately, uh, a little bit of statistics. Uh, I'll take you very easily through those subjects. But most of what I'm going to tell you really will be about personality. And um, in order to do so, I thought this might be useful. So this is a, um, uh, a, a publication I picked up in um, a railway station. <coughs> on sale to the general public. And um, capital letters, it says self-scoring personality tests. And if you notice the author down there, Victor, who tells you he's the honorary international president of Mensa. And you might wonder why he makes it um, so obvious that he has that position. Uh, and I think it's because lots of us, when they're faced with something like a self-scoring personality test, are a little bit dubious about what he might tell you. We, we all know that judging personalities is not so easy. Most of us have the experience of meeting somebody we think we like, taking them out for a dinner and realizing we don't like them. And even worse, you might be married to somebody who <laughs> then realize they're a sign that. So we, we think that a uh, five-minute self-scoring personality test is really not going to be uh, much use, and it won't tell us anything like as much as our partner will tell us when we fail to do the washing up, to hide up the bedroom, uh, you know, the sort of arguments that go on when people open up their hearts to each other. And if you open up this magazine, then you'll find that the questions are um, slightly strange. So. Um, one down here. Do you like to pick up furry animals? <laughs> what on earth is that going to tell you about your personality? And I think most of us um, would think about the problem in, in the following way. So there's, there's one um, question, um, which is, uh, let's see, 
do you disregard other people's feelings? So you have to answer yes or no to that. And most of us will look at that and think, well, you know, that depends. <laughs> well, if I want to impress you, you know, and, and, and I'm taking you out for a nice evening, then yeah, I'm, I'm going to do my best to be nice to you. But as a scientist, if you're standing in the way of a major publication and a scientific advance, I don't really care what you think about it. <laughs> I'll do my best to... Uh, Regard to students. So there's a situational element to the way we would answer these questions. And I think that's fundamentally why we, we are distrustful about this sort of approach. What I have to convince you is that's not the way that psychologists uh, treat these data. For them, it doesn't matter whether you tell the truth or not. They're interested in this data set because it's a set of responses which might be, for example, predictive of whether you are suffering from a psychiatric illness or not. So if I have a group of people who have schizophrenia and a group of people who don't, and I give them this questionnaire, and I find that the people who have schizophrenia are more likely to say, yes, they like to pick up furry animals. I don't really care whether that's true or not. I just use it as an indicator. So the psychologists are using this because it tells them something useful. And the other thing you should realize is that they don't work necessarily with the individual items. So the best way to show you this is to take two questions. Are your feelings hurt? And do ideas run through your head so you cannot sleep? Now, there is no logical reason why if you say yes to one question, you will see yes to the second. But it so happens, if I give this seven questions to this audience or any other group of people, we will find that there's a correlation that people are, in general, more likely to say yes to this one and to that one. They come, as it were, in pairs. And in fact, if you look across all of the questions, you find this correlational structure. The correlational structure is what a psychologist would call factor, or personality factor. And when that's run through Victor's strange set of uh, questions, he pulls up something called this personality factor two, emotional stability, and gives you a little definition of what that might be. Um, I'm going to refer that not as emotional stability, but a rather older word, neuroticism, N. And as I've said, we like to use this for a certain reason, and we use it because it's a predictor of the onset of depression. So people, when they're given this questionnaire, if they score on the N scale, are more likely to get depressed than others. And I also know that it's subject to genetic effects that are shared with depression. That's to say that whatever genetically is making people more likely to be depressed is also increasing their risk of, um, of their, their score in the depression index. I'll just con continue for a few minutes more to talk about the ways that we assess personality and what it means. And this is the I say personality questionnaire. This is what we use. We don't use Victor's one. If you read the instructions here, you'll see that he picks up on the point that I made to you a moment ago. Please answer each question by putting a circle around the yes or the no. There are no right or wrong answers and no trick questions. In fact, the no trick questions is not quite true, as I'll show you in a moment. <laughs> this business about there being no right or wrong is important. You don't really concerned about the truth of it. And work quickly, do not think too long about the exact meaning. So that's, that's essentially what we use. Um, Here's a questionnaire that we gave out, and it's been filled in by one of the subjects of one of our studies. Uh, there's 90 or so items in the, the full questionnaire, and there's one question in down here, um, number 61. Is or was your mother a good woman? And the person who filled up this questionnaire wrote this on the back, <laughs> question 61. I found this very hard to answer. My mother was good in that she provided us with clean clothes, food, a tidy and clean house, but she was and is emotionally cold and lacks empathy. I can understand why this is, but since warmth and empathy is so essential to the well-being of children, I find it hard to deal with her now, and over time her cruelty seems to have increased. She had a hard childhood, years of abuse from my father. It's not surprising, but hard to say whether she is good or not. This is not a yes or no answer. <laughs> <laughs> so this is not the way you're supposed to answer these questions. So just to make it clear, we don't... You know, it's interesting, but that's not what we're looking for. We don't really care about the truth. <laughs> now, there's, there's a, there are other questions in here which you might think are slightly strange. This is, again, the EPQ, and one of them is um, uh, questions like, um, are all your habits good and desirable? And have you ever taken anything, even a pin or button, 
that belong to someone else. Now, so anyone who answers yes to either of those two questions will score one on what is called the lie scale. So these are the trick questions which Isaac tells you aren't actually there. When he devised this, he thought it might be necessary to pick up people who, who really were trying to cheat the system. In fact, that turns out not to be true. It, it picks up something else which is more like a sort of a social conservatism. And um, I'll illustrate this to you. I'll just show you data that I collected. This is from a small group of people, people who were then working for me at the time, people who were interested in this work, and asked for the questionnaires. And I handed out a set of questionnaires. And then in a, in a group meeting, I presented the results to them, as I'm showing you here. And I didn't uh, obviously say who had given what result. And I was just explaining the nature of personality and using the data to make, make these points. So there's an N scale, that's the neuroticism scale, and you'll see F for women here, M for male there. If you just cast your eye over these numbers, you don't need to carry out any statistics, but you'll see that there are more scores over 10 in this group than there are down here. So men are more neurotic than women. And then I explained that there was the E scale, which is extroversion, people who are like going out to parties and having fun. And then there's the uh, L scale, the one that measures lies or social conservatism. And here's the P scale. It's a scale that I said developed for measuring psychoticism, as he, as he called it, a rather poorly defined feature, which usually the psychologists don't use very much. And if you look, most people score very low on this scale. And I was explaining this to the group of people who filled this up, but there's one down there of 10, which is quite high. And as I was um, doing this, uh, uh, my uh, colleague at the back of the room lifted up his hand and said, cool, I got 10 on the P scale. <laughs> and I thought about that answer, and I thought, if I had 10 on the P scale, I'm not sure I would want to broadcast it to the entire group. And that again made me think that maybe this is picking up something of importance, but what that actually is, isn't clear. So that's a brief introduction to the uh, psychology of personality, and the important points to bear in mind is the questionnaires, in terms of the data they provide us, are telling us about a predictive factor. And what we're trying to predict here is what we learn from the N scale about the risk for depression. So the second thing I need to tell you a little bit about, um, for those of you who don't recognize what's written here, it's a DNA sequence. It's just a little bit of genetics. So you all have two copies of your genome. One comes from your father and one comes from your mother. And the genome consists of a string of um, letters, molecular letters, A, C, G, and T. And you have a six billion, three billion from your father, three billion from your mother. Uh, and I've shown you a very small number of them. And in most cases, they're, they're identical. The copy you get from your father and the copy you get from your mother is identical. But there are places you should be able to see in red just about here, where they differ. And I've just shown you one difference. And um, it's random. Uh, your father might have a C and your mother might have a G. It might not be the case. And the consequence of it being random is that you can have either two Gs, two Cs, or you could have, as shown here, one of each. So in a population, we have three possibilities for, for that particular variant. And we call these genetic term for these is a genotype. So there are three genotypes at each of those positions which are variable in the genome. That's really all the genetics you need to know. And what we as geneticists want to know is whether any of those genetic changes predict the phenotypes we're interested in. Personality, depression. And the way we do that is simply ask, do we find more people who are, in this case, severely affected with depression, who have that genotype, and unaffected people have this genotype. Is there some pattern we can see? All you need to do is, once you have that data, is run a statistical test, very straightforward to do, and ask whether that is significant or not. And, and that's something that uh, even psychiatrists can do, and have been doing for a large number of years. And just to show you that, I, I, I did this um, recently. I, took all of the association studies, that's a technical term for what we've done, we've just been asked about the association between the genotype and the disorder. All the association studies in psychiatric genetics, 
And this axis is the number of publications per year. And these are the years. So people started doing this in about 1990. And by about 2004, uh, a bit earlier than that, to about 2000 or so, it's uh, coming out about one per day, 65. And we're now up to about 2,500. So that's a huge amount of information that's been generated using this research. Now I've shown you when I started, my first slide was to tell you this is a subject of interest. So when these papers get published, the press picks up on them. And the question is, um, surely, Dr. Flint, we must have learned an awful lot. We have all of this information that's pulled up. So you're now going to tell us some very interesting things from this uh, literature. So I'm going to give you a couple of stories. And um, my stories are around uh, something I've mentioned to you before, which is this personality trait, neuroticism. And the other thing you need to know a little bit about is something called the serotonin transporter. And the serotonin transporter is the target of a commonly used antidepressant, Prozac part of the molecule that it uh, binds to. And um, for that reason, it's attracted a lot of interest. And people have wondered whether it might be involved in um, many uh, psychiatric conditions that the drug itself affects. So what, is, what do we mean by the serotonin transporter and uh, its genetics? So this is a little diagram. I'm going to go fully into the details about of how geneticists, molecular geneticists, think about the serotonin transporter. So the serotonin transporter is a protein expressed in the brain. And every protein in the body is encoded by a gene. And genes have components to them. And there are components which are called exons. And there's the first exon. And more of the gene is spread out along the chromosome along here. But we're not interested in that, because the bit that the molecular biologists are interested in is something at the front of the gene. And the front of the gene is like the regulatory region, the thing that determines how much of that protein is being expressed. And what was noticed some time ago is that there was a small region here, within this regulatory region, which varied. In other words, there was a, a little deletion or an insertion in this uh, regulatory region. And that affected the amount of the protein that was being, at least the amount of, of uh, the message for the protein that was being produced. And this is a genetic change in the DNA. It's just like what I showed you before, the Gs and the Cs, except it's a, rather than affecting one base, it, it affects a number of these, uh, of these letters. It's 44 of them. And we can therefore express this as uh, in the following way. So you could either have a short one or a long one. You have an insertion or you can have a deletion. So that works just like the G and C that I showed you before. You have a, a probability of inheriting one or the other. So we can therefore produce the three genotypes. So that's L for long, S for short. So that's somebody who's got two short alleles, two long, or, or one of each. And then what you can do, and this work was carried out some years ago, is see whether those three are associated significantly with our measure of neuroticism. So we collect some data. It's the number of people that fall into those categories. We score them with their neuroticism score. And then we ask if there's a difference between those categories, and the answer is that there are significant, by some standards, p-value. And as a consequence, this was work done in um, the 1990s, you will publish a paper saying there is an association of anxiety-related traits. So remember, neuroticism is this personality trait that predicts psychiatric conditions, anxiety and depression. And the polymorphism, the sequence variant, in the serotonin transporter gene regulatory region. And this was published, oh, it's 20 years ago now. Uh, 3,254 papers since then have cited this paper. That's to say this has been a very influential piece of work. And therefore, by some criteria, you'd think was a, a really important observation. Now, what I'm going to do next is just try and think a little critically about how we evaluate that finding and to try and show you that um, things are not quite so simple as they might appear. So this came out in, in 1996, and I told you that doing this study is quite easy. I can give you the questionnaire. You can fill it up in about two or three minutes. You can all, before you leave the room, spit in a small pot. I can extract the DNA, <laughs> and I can genotype, get the information for this S and L polymorphism. Take me about a day. And what was the numbers here? I think it was uh, 
what we say. There's so about three, four hundred. Well, we're not quite up to that number in the audience, but I could probably get some passers by. We could certainly collect a sample of equivalent size within a few hours. And if I did that, then I might um, publish a paper. And here is a series of papers published soon after, three in 2000 and one in the year 1998. And I'm showing you the number of people they recruited, and this is the significant result they get. And a p-value that's less than 0.05 is generally regarded as being significant. And you can see this person found a significant result. This one wasn't, this one wasn't, this one wasn't. So I've headed this inconsistent association study. So they're not consistent with the first paper. Some people are finding it, some people aren't finding it. So it's not so straightforward. So our question then becomes, how do we know who's right? Is there really an effect there? Is this some just noise? What's going on? And there are two ways we can answer this question. One is that we can take all of the published data and we can ask, is there some common pattern going on? And uh, the technical term for this is to carry out a meta-analysis. And I'm showing you this picture. This is my friend Marcus Monaco. And he and I sat down looking at these data about almost 15 years ago now uh, to try and answer this question. And uh, we didn't know how to carry out a meta-analysis. We knew there were such things, but we didn't know the technicalities. So we asked a few friends, worked with them, and we published a paper. And uh, in this meta-analysis, we found that the evidence for the genetic association between N, that's neuroticism, and the serotonin transporter, that's the gene I explained to you, the evidence was that. <laughs> so that's one way that we could address this question. The other one is to say, let's carry out a really big study and collect lots and lots of people and see whether we can see them. So we uh, embarked on, on these uh, two large studies. and. Um, we, we did this in, um, this is the, uh, the EPQ, you've seen this before, this is the, uh, the, um, uh, the thing we used. And I was at that stage living sort of here in Oxford, and we sent out questionnaires to 88,000 people. It's very cheap to do. It's just the postage. You send out the questionnaires and they, and they send them back. So we got responses from 88,000 people. And that's shown here, just to show you what the distribution looks like. So this is the, the, the mean. And I've centered this round zero to make it easy to, to see. And um, those are the two extremes. Now, it turns out that you can get almost all of the genetic information by just getting the genotypes from the two extremes. You don't need to get data from all 88,000 people. You do just as well just to go down to this lot and down to this lot. So we designed a study whereby we wrote to the people here and the people here and said, could, could you send us a cheek swap so that we can genotype and carry out this very important study? Um, just think about this. I didn't. <laughs> we are going to the most neurotic people in the West of England. The most neurotic. <laughs> And we're saying, please, can you send me a cheap swap? Now, some of them did write to us. <laughs> I've just received your request to send a mouse swap. This is the last straw. My holiday has been cancelled. My son is in Windsor. My husband has left me. Now this from you. It is the end. <laughs> so that tells you we are getting the right people. <laughs> very, very so we're quite happy in terms of how this is working. Unfortunately, <coughs> because they're the more neurotic people, they're less likely to take part. So I'm showing you what we get back. And this, this is the more neurotic group. And we're suffering a bit from our acetate. Still, we work it out and decide that it's still a very powerful study. So we analyze the data, and, and this is what we find. So I'm showing you here, I've already pointed out to you that the scores in women are higher than men. So I'm showing you separately men and women, the gray um, 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 male, uh, female, and the, the, and the darker ones are male. And we're looking for a difference in these three bars. So this is the LL, the SL, and the SL. So what you can see is there's no difference. See any difference at all. Uh, we had some colleagues who were doing the same thing. They had collected data from 33,000 men and women on the, this is now the east of England. And they again sent out the, um, this ISEC personality questionnaire. They got 20,000. 
5,000 men and women who answered. And we did the same thing, we selected 5,000 at the end, and uh, this is their result. So we didn't find anything. <coughs> so that, we thought, was pretty conclusive that it doesn't have anything to do with anxiety and depression. But while we're doing that work, this takes some time, and you know, analysis, lined up, and so on, something else has happened, which is that in 2003, this paper was published, uh, again, in, in, uh, this is in a, in a journal that all scientists want to have their name associated with, and it's called Science. If you can't get it published in Science, you want to have it in its sister journal called Nature, uh, and then you will be a, a famous scientist. So this paper had been published in, in Science. Um, so influence of life stress on depression, moderation by a polymorphism in the 5-HTT. So let me just explain what that means. So this is what we seen before. This is the serotonin transporters. It's the same gene. And uh, pressure is, um, is clear, clear enough. But this business about moderation isn't quite so obvious. So I think the best way to explain <coughs> it is to show you the critical result uh, from, that, from that paper. So let's talk through this uh, slowly. So let's start at this side. So you know S and M L stand for the, the, uh, the uh, genotypes. So this is the SS, the short, 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 long, and LL. And what we've said before is that, that uh, the initial claim was that differences between these genotypes was associated with increased risk of depression through uh, neurotic, increased uh, neuroticism scores. And our data suggested that wasn't the case. And you're seeing here, uh, this vertical axis is written this way, the probability of major depression, major depression episode. That really is the neuroticism score. The higher your N score, the more likely you are to become depressed. So just think of this as the N score. It's the same thing. And the claim we saw earlier was that if you have higher, if you have more of this genotype, you're more likely to get depressed. So this is sort of study what we were looking at earlier. Now the difference is there's some other stuff on this on this uh, graph. And that's to do with whether you have bad things happening to you, severe maltreatment, whether probably bad things happen to you. On the left hand side, as I hope is true of all of you, nothing has happened to you. And what you see is that the difference between the genotypes depends on whether a bad thing happened to you. In other words, if I carry out my study of the relationship between this serotonin transporter gene and depression <coughs> or neuroticism on a group of people for whom nothing has happened, no bad things at all, then there's no difference. These three genotypes are exactly the same. They lie together. But if I did it on a group of people who have had bad things happen to them, then I do see a difference. So what they're saying is the genetic effect depends on the context. It depends on whether bad things happen to you. So that was the observation, and this looked uh, extremely interesting. Now, you might begin to suspect where we're going next. The first observation is that not everyone found this. Other people tried to do it. And there are problems here, because it's not quite the same as the study I described before. So let me just pick up a, a couple of issues. So this is the picture I showed you first time. And I'm trying to simplify it, so I made it very simple. I said depression is the risk here, and then we've got these, this axis of, uh, the axis of bad things happening to you. Where this is not anything bad, and this is uh, bad stuff happening. And we said there are different genotypes. I simplified. They have three. I've just made it very simple. So let's just say there's two. And here, you can see there's a difference between these genotypes, and that difference is constant. So regardless of whether a bad thing happens to you or not, we're always seeing a genetic difference. Their claim is that's not true. We don't see this. So here we see a genetic effect, and here we see it dependent upon the environment. So just hold that picture on your head for a moment. Now, look at the next picture. It's splayed out. So I'm just repeating in a way what the first figure showed you, but just making it simple and seeing a bigger difference, though I've allowed there to be a genetic effect here. So that's sort of the same as what they claim. But what about if you saw this in your graph? Would you think that's the same? It sort of levels off here. Or what about if you saw something like this? They start the same, and then they sort of diverge much more. Is that the same? Or even more? 
strangely, what if it's like this, if it crosses over? All of those are possible, and they all have different biological interpretations. So if somebody carries out this study, and they say, I have a significant result, I find there's a change of the genotype effect dependent on the life events, we need to ask whether it's really the same thing, because it might not be. When we plot it out, it might not be. Let me just give you one example. So here is one of the papers, data from one of the papers that claimed they had found the same thing. And, oh, it doesn't quite look right. It's not what we were seeing before. Oh, the genotypes are now written at the bottom here. This, the graph is different. And this is where the, uh, the uh, likelihood of uh, becoming depressed is. And they've now put the two options, low environmental risk and high env environmental risk, uh, and they've plotted it out like that. So it's very hard to see whether that's the same or not. So what I'll do is I'll plot that in the same way as the original study. So I'm going to put on this axis the environmental risk, and this axis the depression symptoms, and this is what we plot out. And you can see this is not the same as the initial graph. It crosses over. It's not the same as that. But the authors claim it is the same. They say, we've replicated. We found the same thing. Hmm, hold on. I don't think you have. This isn't the same. So how do we resolve all of this? Well, guess what? There are two ways we can do this. We can do the meta-analysis, or we can look in a large sample. So I've shown you a picture of another scientist, not my colleague uh, Marcus Marper this time, but uh, Kathleen Merikangas. And I'm showing you this because she and a colleague of hers, who's in fact at UCSF, Neil Risch, had also undertaken a meta-analysis. And myself and my colleague Marcus and Kathleen <coughs> and her colleague Neil, um, we both ended up publishing uh, papers and um, both of us found the same thing. We couldn't see this effect. By the time we'd taken all of these various complications into account, we couldn't replicate it. And as a consequence of that, uh, a paper was published summarizing the results. This is in uh, ooh, science again. It's entitled Back to the Drawing Board for Psychiatric Genetics. And it said there have been all of these papers published claiming an effect, and then these spoil sports, Dr. Rish and Dr. Flint and Dr. Manafo, and Dr. They, they, they say it's not true. They've really made a mess and upset all those psychiatrists. It's so terrible. <laughs> it was terrible. Because I got hate mail, I tell you. We had emails coming in from all over the place saying, like, no, you really don't know what you're talking about. This can't be right. This, this, is, a, this is just uh, not, not a true thing. We'll continue this story in a moment. But I now want to take uh, my third component and tell you uh, uh, another way that people have thought about these problems. So um, this is another title of a paper with a slightly hard to understand subject matter, Intermediate Phenotypes and Genetic Mechanisms of Psychiatric Disorders. So this is really dealing with the subject of today's presentation, the genetic underpinnings of what makes us uh, um, um, healthy or not healthy psychiatrically. But what does this mean, this intermediate phenotypes, and how is it related to genetic mechanisms? And I'm going to explain this to you with a figure from that paper. This is a very beautiful figure, I think. It has many colours in it. <laughs> so I'm a psychiatrist, and therefore I work with uh, conditions called schizophrenia and depression. And can you see those are in grey, smeary, poorly defined? You poor psychiatrists, you really don't know what you're talking about. You just chat to people. That's how you get your information. This is not what you and I call science. Now there are others called psychologists, and they work with things like episodic memory stuff, emotional regulation. And note that these are better defined, brighter colours. That means they're more important than what the psychiatrists deal with. <laughs> but then, the brain. Now the brain has bits labelled in Latin, chordate, putamen. This is getting much more scientific. Anyone who studies the brain itself, clearly they're getting to be a real scientist. And the things they're measuring might be the imaging of the brain, the brain function itself, looking at the <coughs> what's really going on in the brain. But they're still not the really hardcore scientists. Oh, no, no. The really hardcore scientists are down here. They're the molecular people dealing with the molecules of life itself, the DNA. 
is, uh, let me see, oh, serotonin transporter gene. That's a real molecule. And there's other genes here on chromosomes. So this figure has a message. And that message is that there's a sort of pattern going from left to right. And you can see that indicated by the arrows. That you start off with really hardcore science, and it gets sort of blurred as you go through the brain. And then finally, you end up with the stuff that psychologists use, which is probably OK. But the last thing you want to be dealing with is the depression and schizophrenia, because that's so hard to work with. It's much easier if you can work with this stuff. And even better, of course, if you can work down this side of the graph. So what that means is if you're a scientist working in this area, you really ought to be measuring things going on in the brain. And that can help you with your genetics, because that will be much more rooted. So they describe this in the following way. So the assumption of this intermediate phenotype strategy, so that's a big, pretty picture graph, is that the genetic effects at the level of the brain are a more direct effect of genetic variation than the complex behavior. So it's much easier to work with those things, and that's the studies we should be carrying out. So is this true? This is another paper in Science, my favorite journal. So uh, serotonin transporter, so you all know what that is now. And the response of the human amygdala, so that's a region of the brain that's involved in emotional regulation. And you can do a study where you can present to people a frightening stimulus. They use faces. And then they can look at the activation of the amygdala. And uh, you will get out of a, a functional magnetic resonance uh, imaging scan. So here's the, you know, the, the, the uh, data you get. And um, so we're looking at little red dots here and here. This is in the amygdala. And uh, this is the response to the fearful stimulus. And what this group have done is they've genotyped two cohorts, and they're looking, if you look up here, you'll recognize S for short, L for long, so I hope you're familiar now, and you'll know that's the short and long alleles of the serotonin transporter. And they're trying to see if that gene, that, those, genotypic, those genotypes, predict differences in the response. So let's see what they find. So here are our results. These are the genotypes, the short SLA. They, for reasons we won't go into, they, they sort of squeeze these two together to make nice two groups. And these are the scores. There's a big score point <coughs> and a smaller score there, this uh, image. And then they work out the P, which is less than 0.05, and uh, they can publish it. Now, that's actually not our question here. The question that uh, we're trying to address, the assumption behind this, is whether the effect on this signal is bigger than the effect that it might be on personality. So it's, it's, this is closer to the genes. It's like really importantly close, and therefore it should be a big effect. The people in, who wrote this paper didn't, didn't report this particular uh, fact, so I'll, I'll give it to you. So what they say is that the genetic effect is 28%. That's to say that 20% of the variation that they're seeing is due to this single gene. That's a very, very big effect, very important. So, in theory, of course, that supports their hypothesis. And it would suggest that if we're going to carry out studies like this, we really will be much better working with these sorts of phenotypes. I hope you're beginning to realize what's going to come next. So, let's query a little bit this figure. Is it likely to be true? Now, we know the answer to this question because in the last uh, 10 years or so, it's been possible to Rather than interrogate a single gene, interrogate all of the genes at one go, and therefore give us a very broad, very comprehensive picture of how genetic effects work. And the ways these results get presented are in diagrams that look like this. And what we're seeing here is the name of the phenotype. These are the diseases that were looked at. These numbers here represent chromosomes. And the vertical axis represents the likelihood that they've actually found something. And where it turns green is an indication that the scientists are pretty convinced they've found something. So this is a, a robust technology. And let me just show you the result for the phenotype that we've been talking about a lot, neuroticism. So here is a, a scan for neuroticism, and it's uh, finding something here on chromosome 8 and uh, something on chromosome 9. Um, 
there's uh, um, other evidence, which I won't go into to support this, but basically that they find things. So now we know you can find things using this technology, but the question that we're interested in here is not whether we can find things or not, but like, how big is this effect? Is this, this one here, is that explaining 25% of the variation? Less? And the one we're really interested in is the things that affect the brain. So remember the claim is that if we look at things that affect the brain, we'll find very big effects. So that has now been mapped. This is another genome-wide association study. Here's a little significant threshold here, and here's a little peak, and there's some, some effects there. So how big are those effects? So in order to answer that question, I decided to get all of the data that's been collected in the last 20 years. I took all of the studies, thousands of them, and I got the effect size, and I plotted them out. Here's the result. So this is the effect size here, and this is the number of studies, thousands of them, thousands of them. So that what we're looking for is something like 28%. That will be over here. <laughs> Just to make that clear. <coughs> Nobody has found anything like that. Not a sign of it. Absolutely nothing. So I'm going to bring my talk to an end by asking what I think is the most important question. I've showed you now a number of stories where people have claimed things which have been very hard to substantiate. And where a lot of the evidence suggests that it probably wasn't right. So I think we have to ask why? Why should people publish these studies, make these claims, and why should there be so much heat, so much disagreement? What is going on here? So this is something that anyone can talk about. You don't need to be a scientist. You just need to come up with some ideas as to what would make people come to different conclusions. And I had this conversation with my colleague Marcus. And we thought that maybe what was important here was where you lived. Why did we think that? Because we know there are different scientific cultures, different countries, different ways of thinking, depend on where you're brought up. So we wanted to test this hypothesis. So in order to test this hypothesis, we took all of the literature that we could find, and we asked, how likely is it that you have a positive result dependent on where you live? So we take a measure of the effect, a bigger effect, more likely to be positive. So we divide up the studies in terms of the effect size, and then we look where they were published. So our measure of effect size is called an odds ratio, or OR. So if you were in America, you, the median was about 1.1, in Europe, it's 0.96, and elsewhere, it's 0.95. So that means that it's more likely, regardless of the study you do, if you're in this country, you're more likely to publish a positive result, regardless of whether it's true or not. So where you live depends on whether you find something important. Well, obviously, it can't be right, but that's what we're finding. So then we asked, well, what might be explaining that? So we decided to... <coughs> work out a slightly more refined measure of this. What we came up with is what we called a bias index. And I've defined it here. Basically what we've done is we've taken the effect size, the odds ratio, and we've divided that odds ratio by what everyone else found. So if 100 people did the study, some people found two, some people found zero, we take the, the mean of that, let's say it's one, and we take the, the mean of the individual countries, and then we divide one by the other. So if you overestimate, it will be over one, and if you underestimate, it will be less than one. But that's nothing to say about the truth of the finding, it's just taking published studies. So here, we plotted this measure of bias against the amount of money that was going into science, which is uh, R&D. And there's a really nice relationship. So if governments pump money into science, they expect some return. So you really need to publish a positive finding. That's what that's telling us. So that seemed to be one reason why people are publishing things which may not always be true. The second thing that's very important is what's called an impact factor. An impact factor is what a journal has. If a journal publishes a finding, other people, if they think it's interesting, will cite that paper and 
more people will read it, and therefore you can, for each journal, come up with a measure of the journal's impact by looking at how many people cite the work. So a measure of how important you are. So I put this in the context. If you publish something in science or nature, I told you those were important journals, the impact factor is about 30. But if you publish in a journal of not very interesting science, the factor will be like 1.2 something. So we then publish uh, our findings in important journals, and we look to see whether those uh, relate to the, uh, this um, bias index. So this is our, our measure of bias on this index here. So anything above one is biased in favor, and below one is biased uh, against. And here is the impact factor. And what you can see is that journals with bigger impact factors are publishing, um, um, in general, biased results. So they're, they're showing papers with odds ratios which are above what we would expect. Oh, this number is like 25. So I told you there are not many journals which are that high. So this, is, in fact, is Nature and Science. These are the really important journals. So the really important journals are publishing biased results, which is a slightly unexpected conclusion. Now, the other thing that we did when we published this is that we show the results as big or little circles. And the big or little circles defines the size of the study. So if you did a very big study, you get a very big circle. If you did a very small study, you get a little tiny circle. And if you remember, I said there were two ways to determine the likelihood of finding something, whether it's true or not, to do a meta-analysis or a very big study. The bigger the circle, the better the result. The more likely it is you get the right result. So the other implication of this, if you look, is that the big circles are down here. The smallest circles are up here. So that means that the really high-profile journals are publishing biased results in small samples, the least likely to be the correct answer. So why should this be? There is a lot of uh, uh, discussion about this. And one of the reasons is that scientists, to make uh, their career, really have to publish here. It's really important for them. It won't survive very long. If you're publishing down here in these low-impact journals, you're not going to get a job. And in order to get here, you have to have a really interesting finding, something novel and interesting. That's what the journals look at. So you send a, a paper in, and they'll make a decision as to whether they think it's interesting or not. And you can see that the things most likely to get in are those which show a positive result, it's interesting, even if it is in a small sample and therefore less likely. <coughs> so there's a cultural issue in science which is causing us some problems. And there's been a lot of discussion about this, and we still don't know quite how to overcome this bias. It's something inherent in the way that science is carried out. And I'll finish one last slide. Uh, and if you want to look at this in detail, I strongly recommend this is freely available. You can download this yourself. And uh, this is one title that doesn't need explaining at all. It's completely obvious as to what this is about, why most published research findings are false. And I've given you a couple of hints today as to why that's the case. And I hope that by thinking through these issues, you won't fall into the same pitfalls that many people do when they open up a newspaper and say, shock, horror, new genetic finding. This is the cause of infidelity. This gene is to blame. <laughs> you remember my talk and say to yourself, Dr. Flint told me this is rubbish. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> so we have a few minutes for questions for those of you who wish to ask. So what about looking at people with diagnosed clinical depression? The genetic, um, so that is something that, that, uh, that my group has done. and. Um, so the requirements for carrying out such a study are, are that you would need a very large sample size, which is in fact what we did. So I showed you results uh, for the personality trait and eroticism. That needed 170,000 people to get that result. Um, we didn't need so many for depression. It's a, uh, a clinical disorder, so in a sense it's a bit like doing the extremes. Remember I showed you, you collect a large distribution to get the information from the extremes. But yes, we have done that, and we do find genetic effects we can replicate. What's that looking like? Uh, it's looking like we're just getting the first clues. We know that stuff's there, but it's a little too early to really interpret. This is published last year. Yeah. Yeah.
you mentioned meta-analysis as being um, one way of evaluating the um, results of you know, particular um, research findings. Um, but I guess, at least for studies on drugs, probably one of the most common meta-analysis is um, the, the pooled study, um, the, the pooled analysis. And uh, I got into an argument with a friend of mine who has a background in math, and he was saying that um, pooled analysis are not statistically very good. Um, and um, he pointed me to some um, journal articles that said the same thing. So I'm yeah. There's, it's not ideal. Uh, if, if it's, it's, it has the big advantage that it's very cheap. Uh, you just need to pull the data off the internet and run the analysis yourself. Anyone with a, access to a, a laptop could do this. But because the studies are carried out in such different environments and there are so many biases that might be hidden, uh, it's, it can be hard to know whether the results you've got are, are robust or not. So one of the things I didn't go into is, and you can carry out analysis to indicate whether the individual studies are heterogeneous or not. So if you carry out a meta-analysis without taking into account the fact that maybe three quarters of the studies you've looked at are carried out in women and the other quarter are carried out in men, and I've shown you that there are differences between men and women on these scores, then you could be led to draw incorrect conclusions. So you need to carry out tests to detect those differences. But often the researchers themselves may not tell you, or they may not even know what those biases might be. So, so it, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, if you've got nothing else, it's a good way to go. But uh, ideally, you should do a properly designed study, and in this case, it would need a very large sample size. So maybe this is a very basic question, question for some. But what would be the next step after we come up with a study that? is positive mm -hmm. and it's, we are confident it's positive and we find that, that this phenotype actually corresponds to these genes and yes. we know that these genes are responsible. Yes. Then what would be the next step, like gene therapy or? No, I, I, that, that's not going to work. So what we know about these conditions, and I emphasize this, is that things are really complicated. It's really hard to get resu these results out at all. And once you've got those results, you've got a, a, a the, the real problem is trying to put them into some biological framework. So I've just shown you little pictures of lines on them. And that's really all they are. It's just telling us we've got a, a p-value. So you've got a huge problem of turning that into the effect of a gene. But let's suppose you do those experiments and you can now say, well, I've got a series of genes that I think are involved in this phenotype. You've then got to come up with some hypotheses about why those genes are having their effect. The nice thing about genetics is that it is hypothesis free. You make no assumptions about what the genes do. All we're saying is there's a genetic effect. But the bad thing about genetics is it doesn't generate any hypothesis for you. It's entirely up to you to do that. So you look at those genes, many of them have something like a, a weird number, ZNF, ZNF567, ORF63, meaningless. Generally because people have no idea what those genes do. They're just a bit of random sequence in the genome. So you then faced with a lot of work trying to understand what that gene does. There's lots of people around the world working systematically across each gene. They're doing mutation studies in mice. They're doing expression studies. They're trying to get a, a broad picture so that hopefully by the time you do get to the stage where we're just about to get to now, you can take that information and begin to say, oh, I know what that gene does. It's involved in this processing of this molecule in this neuron. So maybe what's happening is that pathway is a little different in people with depression and without. And then you can go and try and test that hypothesis. And let's suppose you've done all of that work and you now know that the genes you find are involved in determining how neurons get connected in the brain. There might be some developmental effect. You then like to know, well, can I alter that? Can I change the way so that I can improve my patient's health? But 10, 15 years, maybe longer. It's a long struggle at the moment. Mm -hmm. 10 years is not that bad. It's <laughs> true. I suppose we've been working with this for almost 20. Yeah, that's right. yes. Has the, um, the high impact journals that you had over on the right hand side with the small sample size, yes. has that been historically um, the same all along? Or is that evolved over time that they just picked and chose the most exciting articles? To um, 
Well, that's a very interesting question. I don't know. I think one of the issues has been that the, the, uh, the studies of the sort that need large sample sizes have, have really only come to the point where they can be submitted and published in these high-profile journals relatively recently. So, so certainly in psychiatry, psychiatry you know, was a graveyard for careers. It's the last place you wanted to do research. But, and particularly if you worked in hardcore molecular genetics. Everyone would tell you 20 years ago, don't go anywhere near it. You're never going to ever find anything. And the, the solution has been that you needed to do these very large studies. So, so it's, been, it's, it's taken quite a long time to, to get, get, get to that stage. What, what I would hope would be the case is that what I've shown you is a sort of blip on the graph. That if we look five years down the line, we'll see that um, now they're only publishing these really well-powered studies. And th there's some evidence that's true. Certainly in genetics, people now know the sorts of problems that I've described to you, and people are, are now much more critical about what, what they'll accept. But it's not true of all disciplines. I mean, certain areas of psychology have suffered this with, with uh, uh, lots of bad press coming out about unreplicated findings and so on. The, 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 the area that might be worth looking at in, is it, I, is, would be in physics. So actually physics has had this problem. When phys physics moved away from just saying we know what an electron, you know, what the basic structure of, of a nucleus is, the experiments they now do are those things that need um, enormous machines buried under mountains in Switzerland to get, to get an answer. And what they do is they generate vast amounts of data. They're colliding particles together, and they're getting a lot of data, and they're just looking for really, really rare events. They're looking for the collision that's produced a predicted particle, and that doesn't happen very often. So they have to put lots and lots and lots and lots of data to try and find um, the result that either proves or disproves their hypothesis. And I, I, um, I met the, the man who published the, um, one of the people leading the, the study on the studying the, the finding this the boson. This was published as the, you know the, the God particle. I think it came out in the in the press. And uh, I was asking him how they knew that they found it because they have the same problem. They've got lots of data. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's not. How, how do they know it's right? And they have a criteria there. They call it the five sigma rule, which means that yeah, they, the thing has to be more than five of these units away from what they're what they're observing. And I said, how did you come up? How did you work out this rule? How do you know that's the right one to apply? And because he's a physicist, I thought he would then write out lots of equations and explain to me unambiguously that this must be the right answer. But in fact, he didn't do that. He just said, because three sigma didn't work. <laughs> so it was, just in, it was just arrived empirically. So they've had the same problems that geneticists have. So maybe, going back to your question, if we went back and looked in the physics journals, we'd see the same sort of problem, that there were small sample sizes giving unreplicated results, and that's now being resolved. They now have a, a, a better threshold, and they get their statistics correct. That's an interesting question. I'll, 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 I'll think about it. Thank you. I think we should stop for questions. Oh, no, we should stop. Well, thank you very much for coming. I'm sorry we can not get any more questions, but I need to get Dr. Um, Flint to the airport to go back to Los Angeles. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you.